So we focus on the breath. There are two important qualities that are being developed. One is mindfulness. That's the ability to keep something in mind. Like reminding yourself to stay with the breath. And the other is alertness, watching what's going on. But mindfulness and alertness are on their own. No, no, not enough. You have to have the quality of ardency. The motivation that you really want to do this well. And this that this is an important exercise we're involved in right here, training the mind. It's these three qualities working together that enable us to get results. So it's not just a matter of watching whatever comes up. The quality of a right effort is important, which is what ardency is all about. And it does involve desire. And the mindfulness and alertness there are important for keeping that desire alive. Because there are times we have to remind ourselves of why we're doing this. This is especially true when the mind feels lazy, feels more inclined to wander off someplace else, or not even meditate at all. And that's when you have to keep in mind that the dangers of not meditating and the importance of meditating. And sometimes the mindfulness is useful to cajole ourselves into meditating, and other times it has to use threats. That the cajoling is when you remind yourself of the good things that come from meditation, a sense of ease, a sense of well-being. If you're new to the meditation, you may not have gotten a great sense of ease and well-being, but you've heard reports about it. If you have been meditating for a while, you've had some taste of this. And so you want to be able to remind yourself, this is a good thing we're doing here. At the very least, the mind is not getting in trouble. It's not causing harm to itself. It's not causing harm to anybody else. That right there is something important. Because otherwise you find the mind planning things, and even though it may not be harming anybody yet, sometimes its plans are going to lead you to do something that will harm somebody. I had a student one time who said he'd get involved in sexual fantasies. And the idea of inflicting them on other people scared him. And so the mind can get involved in all kinds of strange scenarios. You've got to remind yourself, okay, this is, this is dangerous. Because if you let the mind wander into those scenarios, they become more and more habitual. It becomes harder and harder not to act on them. This is where that second function of mindfulness comes in, is the threatening. Say, look, watch out. If you don't train the mind, it's going to be trouble. And even if you don't get involved in doing grossly unskillful things, you've still got this problem. You've got this body here, subject to aging, illness, and death. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to prepare? Most people prepare by pretending it's not going to happen, but that's not preparing at all. That's just making the situation worse. You've got to learn how to think about these things, plan for them in an intelligent way, in a way that doesn't get you depressed, that doesn't get you disturbed, but actually encourages you to practice realizing that this is your way out. The chant we had just now, and 
world is swept away, it does not endure, offers no shelter, there's no one in charge. The world is nothing of its own, it's a slave to craving. Those are useful themes to think about. They come from a sutta where a monk is explaining to a king why he ordained. He came from a good family, he was wealthy, had all kinds of pleasures. And the king was curious, why would anybody like that want to ordain? Why would anyone like that want to practice? So the monk lists these reasons. The king still doesn't understand. That's one of the things you notice a lot in the Pali Canon, is that kings are pretty much innocent when it comes to spiritual matters. They're so wound up in their, their wealth and their power, and maintaining their wealth and maintaining their power. They're total children when it comes to understanding what life is all about. I knew a monk one time in Thailand who had generals and prime ministers coming to him for advice. And he commented on how talking to them and uh, their jealousy of other people and their concern about maintaining their power and who was getting ahead of whom. It was like little kids, totally immature. And these are the people who are running the country. It's also noticeable in the canon that when the Buddha is talking about the drawbacks of human life, he illustrates it with the problems that kings face, i.e. the people who had the most power, who seemed to have the best position in human society. And even that position didn't protect them. It actually exposed them to more dangers. both dangerous from outside and dangerous from inside. There's one passage when he talks about how people who are obsessed with maintaining their power end up doing lots of unskillful things, imprisoning other people, working to prevent other people from harming them. And in doing all these unskillful things, they they don't like to have their unskillful things looked into, and they end up not wanting to look into anybody else's unskillful things either. So it's a snowballing effect. The more you harm other people, the more you get off into a world of unreality. But even if you're a relatively moral ruler, you still got those problems of aging, illness, and death which correspond to the Buddhist teachings on inconstancy, stress, and not-self. When the Buddha talks about those three perceptions he wants you to hold, they're not just grabbed out of the air someplace. They relate to the fact that we that change means aging in the human body. And wherever there's aging, there's going to be the illness and the stress that comes with the illness, even before you really get old. And when death comes, you have to let everything go. And that's how the, the monk, his name is Ratabala, explains these things to the king. And the king doesn't understand the saying that the world is swept away, it does not endure. Ratabala asks him, when you were young, were you strong? The king said, yes, I was very strong. It was almost like I had the strength of two people. Ratabala says, how about now? He says, no, no, now I'm 80 years old, and sometimes I mean to put my foot in one place and go someplace else. And there's no matter how much control you can gain over the body when you're young and strong. It doesn't stay that way. It's not like it's made a pact with you that it's going to continue being obedient, or it's going to warn you ahead of time if there's going to be trouble down the line. You suddenly find yourself losing this measure of control, that measure of control, things you used to be able to do, you suddenly find yourself unable to do. And you can't say that the body betrayed you because it never made any promises. We're the ones who place all our expectations on what the body's going to do for us. I 
Buddhist with the saying, the world offers no shelter. This one the monk illustrates with the teaching on illness. He says, even though you're king, say, do you have a recurring illness? And the king says, yes, he does. In fact, sometimes it gets so bad that his courtiers are just stand around and say, well, now he's going to die, now he's going to die. And the monk says, well, can you order them to share out your pain so you feel less pain? He says, no, I've got to face all that pain on my own. No matter how good doctors can get, there, come a point, there comes a point where they just have to throw up their hands. They can't do any more to help prevent pain. Then you're left to face it on your own. As for the statement that the world has nothing of its own, the king says, look, I have all this money. How can you say the world has nothing of its own? And the monk replies, well, can you take that with you? The king says, no, I've got to leave it here. When I die, pass on and leave everything. It's a teaching on not-self. Yet in spite of this, there's the fact that we're a slave to craving. We just keep wanting more and more and more of these things that we can't really control, that we can't, that can't offer us any real protection, that we're going to have to let go of in, in the end anyhow. This is illustrated with a question, do you rule over a prosperous nation? The king says, yes. You think that would be enough, but suppose someone comes from the east and says, there's another prosperous nation over to the east, and you could conquer that and be even wealthier. Would you do it? The king says, sure. How about if there's another one to the west, to the north, to the south? The king says, sure, in all cases. How about on the other side of the ocean? The king would go for that, too. So here we are. That even though the goods of the world, our bodies, our possessions, our relationships, are not really under our control. They can't really protect us from all the pains of life. And there are things we're going to have to leave behind anyhow, yet we want more and more and more of them. The whole purpose of this is to get a sense of sangwega, of how futile the whole process is. And if we don't train the mind, we're just going to keep on doing it again and again and again. That old story in the commentaries about the Buddha seeing the old person and the sick person and the dead person, as if for the first time ever, it illustrates his point as well. But then there's the fourth person he sees, and that's the forest mendicant. When he realizes, okay, maybe if there's a way out, this is it. Go off and look into your mind, because that's where the craving comes from. Take the time. Provide yourself with the opportunity to really look into the mind and see where does this craving come from, what can be done to put an end to it. Because otherwise you're going to be stuck in this continual wandering on, in this continual sense of dissatisfaction finding things that don't really provide any real satisfaction, and yet you keep looking for them again and again and again. And John Fuhrman once said, if there's anything that you really long for in this life, it's a sign that you had it in a previous lifetime and you miss it. And of course, if you, even if you gain it this time around, you're going to lose it again, you're going to miss it again. So the only way out is right here at the breath, where we develop these qualities of mindfulness, alertness, and ardency. That'll enable the mind to settle down and really watch itself. And when it watches itself, it can begin to say, okay, this is where craving arises, this is where it passes away. And what are the assumptions behind the craving? The mind has this tendency to paint things in all kinds of beautiful colors. But it'll, and like any paint, the paint starts to wear off, it starts to blister, it starts to peel. It begins to fade. 
It's only because we keep on painting and painting and painting over and over and over again that we still feel attracted. But you've got to realize it's just on the surface. There's no real satisfaction in these things. It sounds pessimistic, but it's really more realistic. This is the way we live. And you, could, you look at other people's lives and you get a very strong sense of how futile human life can be. But for some reason it's hard to look at your own life and see the same thing. Unless you're willing to take that message from the Force Mendicant that you've got to look into your mind and do some serious work. Otherwise the process is endless. Someone once asked the Buddha, Will all the world eventually gain awakening? Will half of it gain awakening? The Buddha didn't answer. Ananda, who was sitting by, was concerned that the man might go away dissatisfied that the Buddha, when he was asked an important question like this, faltered. So he took the man aside and said, It's like a fortress with a good gate gatekeeper. The gatekeeper wanders around the fortress, surveys the wall, sees that it's a totally solid wall without even a crack big enough for a cat to slip through. And so he knows that whoever's going to come in and out of the fortress is going to have to come in and out through the one gate. Now he doesn't know how many people are going to come, whether it's the whole world or half the world or anybody at all, but he does know that if anyone's going to come into the fortress, they've got to do it through the gate. In the same way, he said, the Buddha's knowledge of awakening is such that he knows that there is this one path. Virtue, concentration, discernment are the Eightfold Path, of the different variations that we find in the Wings to Awakening. Anyone who's going to gain awakening is going to do it this way. He doesn't know how many people are going to do it. There's no guarantee that we're all going to get there. But the Buddha does know that this is the way. He's not saying this simply because he was Indian or because he lived 2,000 years ago, or those are the assumptions of his culture. Because in many ways his teaching was very contrary to Indian assumptions at the time. It's a truth that holds for all time. That we've got to train the mind. If we're going to find any true happiness, any happiness that's really worth the effort that goes into it, any happiness that's not going to let us down. So when the Buddha's pointing out the deficiencies of human life, it's not because he's pessimistic, it's because he wants to make sure that we don't get stuck on these things, because they don't offer any real satisfaction. I was reading recently about someone who's saying that we got our, these ideals in our head that enlightenment is going to be a perfect happiness, but that's just an archetype. It's inhuman, it's superhuman. When we don't let ourselves get too carried away by this, then we have the room for kindness, i.e. to let ourselves have a nice easy path rather than pushing ourselves too hard. That's not kindness at all. True kindness is when you point out the fact, okay, this is the way to happiness. It's going to be demanding. And you've got to be careful. Like if you don't follow this path, you're just setting yourself for a lot, for a lot more suffering. And that's not being unkind or superhuman or too demanding. It's just pointing out the facts that this is the way things are. But it's the kindness there is that it reminds you that you really do have to do this work, but it's going to re be rewarded. There is this possibility. The teaching that says that this is impossible, that's not kindness at all, it's cruelty. It's denying that there is this opportunity for true happiness. That's not helping anybody at all. So sitting around thinking about how wonderful the world is and how learning how to appreciate the sunset and say that when you see the 
the luminosity of the world in the evening when the sun is glowing in the west, that that's an enlightenment. That's selling everybody short. It's closing off the way. So there are times when the sterner voice is the one that's really kind. Remember your teachers in school. Some of the teachers were really stern. They demanded a high level of achievement, high level performance. And as children, we probably didn't like them. But as you grow up and begin to reflect on it, you realize that those were the teachers who really cared. They were the ones who were really kind. They didn't just let you get away with things just to make it easy for everybody. So there will be times when the path is demanding, but always keep in mind the fact it is worth it. And even though the teachings may sometimes sound negative, the import is positive. True happiness is possible. And this is the way it's done.